welcome. My name is Jennifer Burnham, and I am an Associate Professor of Geography here at Augustana College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Augustana Center for Polar Studies Winter Science Lecture. And in a few moments, I'll introduce you our guest speaker today, who is Dr. Laura Koenig from NASA Goddard on the East Coast of the United States. Um, but before I do that, I want to just make a plug for our spring term science lecture, sponsored by the Polar Center. It'll be Dr. Steve Haziotis. He's from the University of Kansas. And this will be on Thursday at 7 p.m., March 27th. And he'll be talking about uh, trace fossils that he has worked on in Antarctica. But tonight, uh, we have our visiting guest lecturer, Dr. Laura Koenig. She's from NASA Goddard. She's an expert in remote sensing of ice sheets and snow. She spent more than a year in the Arctic and the Antarctic to validate science satellite measurements and expand algorithms over large areas. She'll tell us tonight about her NASA missions, such as Operation Ice Bridge, that monitor the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, providing broad scale coverage, as well as the new Grover solar powered robot capable of autonomously monitoring accumulation. Dr. Koenig will focus on a new understanding of Greenland meltwater based on radar data, radar data gathered by these missions. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Koenig. We're going to talk about monitoring polar ice using satellite airplanes and a new robot. I'm going to start out with kind of some of the frequently asked questions, and one of the most is NASA studies ice on Earth, really? Um, most people don't really believe that. Well, actually, <laughs> You know, NASA studies four components of science, astrophysics, heliophysics, planetary sciences, and earth sciences. Sometimes you don't hear as much or think about NASA as the earth science. These are um, all satellite missions measuring different components of, thank you, um, of earth science. Um, and there are quite a few. They measure oceans, winds, speeds, precipitation, gravity measurements, uh, and you'll even see some ice sat, um, the satellites that measure ice. So yes, NASA studies ice. We even have the Cryospheric Sciences Laboratory. We're official. We have a logo. Um, and in um, my laboratory, we study a lot of different types of snow and ice. So uh, the cryosphere, anything that's frozen, lake ice, ice sheets, glaciers, seasonal snow, um, and sea ice. Uh, here's a picture of Operation Ice Bridge flying over the ice sheets as well. And, and I'll, I'll, uh, this is what our larger community does. And, and as we go through the talk, I'll show you what I focus on. So in our laboratory, we actually have three very directed polar missions. We have ISAT. Uh, which was actually stopped collecting measurements in 2009, well, from 2003 to 2009. It was a laser altimeter, just like I'm using this laser pointer. As I sat pointed at different things, it could tell you the distance to that object, and it could monitor how the ice sheet went up and down. As ISAT was starting to fail, the laser was starting to burn out, they knew this, they started flying Operation Ice Bridge. They said, we need to continue to monitor the ice sheets. The ice sheets are changing rapidly. Um, and we will do this using an aircraft. And we'll put a similar laser altimeter on the aircraft. But, well, we don't want an empty aircraft. We have more space. And so they put radars on the aircraft as well. And, and this is one of my expertise. So they, they added four different radars. They also added a gravimeter, a magnetometer. They packed the airplane full. And right now, Operation Ice Bridge, we're just going to be planning the next uh, Greenland mission. It monitors Greenland in March, April, May. And it monitors the Antarctic in um, November, October, November, December. And Operation Ice Bridge is going to monitor the ice sheets until ISAT-2 is launched. ISAT-2 will be launched in the 2017 time frame, and I believe they're just starting to develop the instruments um, for that satellite. So right now, with Operation Ice Bridge, even though we're not getting as much coverage, we're actually in kind of a golden age, I would say, of getting a significant amount of data over the ice sheets. And I'll remind you, actually, this is a photo um, or an, an image taken, a, a picture taken from the Apollo 17 mission. Uh, 
Um, and this was one of the first images of Antarctica. So NASA, even though they didn't really know it in this, has been studying the polar regions for even longer than they think. Well, why do we want to study the poles? Um, and I'll see if this works. I have a lot of animations in my talk. If some of them don't work, um, I'll, I'll let you know. Well, okay, we want to study the poles because right now we have the polar bowl vortex happening. We might want to know a little bit more about that and what the implications are for the Super Bowl. <laughs> well, that's really weather. We look more at climate. So I do not know about this. So please, I don't know why the weather is so cold and I don't know how it's going to affect the Super Bowl. But we want to study the polar regions because the polar regions affect the entire globe. What I'm showing here is a visualization of the thermohaline circulation. So as the polar currents come up to Greenland, the water gets cold, the sea ice forms, it takes and expels some of the salt, it gets dense, and it's the pump right here off of uh, the east coast of Greenland. It's sort of one of these big pumps that is pumping all of the ocean water in um, the thermohaline circulation. So again, thermohaline, temperature, and salt. It drives the ocean currents. So the ocean goes up, it gets cold around Greenland, it sinks, that bottom water flows around the world, it comes down to the, to the uh, circumpolar Antarctic current, circles around Antarctica. We are tied to the polar regions because the polar regions affect um, our oceans, which affect our climate. Not only the oceans, but when we talk about the sunlight coming in, if we have white poles, the sunlight is reflected back to space. We call this the albedo. As it gets darker, that sunlight comes in and it, it, it is absorbed. So a whiter Arctic, I'll run this one again. A whiter <coughs> Arctic means more heat and sunlight is reflected back to space. This is what we call the albedo effect. As we get darker surfaces, um, we'll have amplified Arctic warming. We already know this is occurring. The sea ice is shrinking. We're getting darker as well. The Greenland ice sheet is getting darker. We also care about the polar regions because Greenland and Antarctica are our largest storage of ice on land. If we start to melt that ice, we'll raise sea level. Um, the estimates for sea level rise, maybe even just five, ten years ago, was about a meter by 2100. This has actually gone down maybe a little bit more. They pushed that date out a little bit. Um, but maybe a half meter by 2100. This is what the globe would look like. All these red areas would be flooded if we had um, a half or a meter of sea level rise. And you'll see that not all areas are created equal. Um, some of the population centers around the East Coast, um, as well as Bangladesh, these regions will be uh, hit much harder than other regions. People ask, why do you study the cryosphere? Why do I want to be cold? Go out to the cryosphere? Well, here's a picture of me circa 1980. Grew up in Eugene, Oregon. I always just loved to go out. Anytime there was snow, I put skis on, went out and played. This is me two days ago with my son out. We decided to build a snow cloud. <laughs> snow is fun. And I've always wanted to study it, and I always um, enjoyed science. So that got me in um, to studying uh, first avalanche studies, and then I moved on to studying the ice sheets. So this is what I study, Greenland and Antarctica. And I'm going to talk about Greenland and Antarctica. You know, to you, remember Greenland's in the North Pole, Antarctica's in the South Pole. When I think about the ice sheets from a satellite point of view, I'm really thinking of this white reflective material and the way the electromagnetic waves interact with it isn't really that much different in Greenland and Antarctica. So I'll talk about them and how I study different um, physical properties over them, kind of like they're the same, but just so we start out, Greenland is about the size of Antarctica, or is about the size of Alaska, plus the Pacific Northwest. Remember, Greenland is a territory of Denmark. Many people live, like 50,000 people live in Greenland um, on the edges where there's land. Antarctica 
It's not owned by or, or governed by any nation. It's governed by the Antarctic Treaty. About one and a half times the size of the United States. If you were to melt all of Greenland, we don't expect this to happen. You'd have about seven meters of sea level rise. If you were to melt all of Antarctica, you'd have about 60 meters of sea level rise. And I'll start out with a few definitions as we go through. What is an ice sheet? An ice sheet is snow that's piled up over many years. It flows under its own weight. Ice will flow under its own weight. Think of like honey. You put it on a pancake and you splurge out. As the ice flows under its own weight, it comes out, it meets the ocean, it can form ice shelves. This point um, where it meets and flows into the into the ocean or into a fjord. This is called the grounding line, and it is at this point where you actually start to displace ocean water. So you have to go through this point here to actually be um, causing some sort of sea level change. It forms ice shelves. These are about 100 uh, or 1,000 feet thick. And then we have sea ice that sits out here on the ocean. And again, it is the ocean water freezing and then rethawing seasonally, it does not affect sea level rise. We have these large masses of ice, and our goal is to figure out their mass balance, and mass balance is a fancy term for volume, the volume of the ice, um, essentially, and how is it changing? Um, temperatures are warming in both the Arctic and Antarctic, what is that doing to ice? If there's one thing we know, it's that if you warm up the temperatures outside, the ice on the roads will melt. If we warm up temperatures above freezing, ice melts. So we want to figure out the ice sheet mass balance. There's different parts. So again, the ice flows under its own weight, and we have regions um, where it flows into an ice shelf, and it calves off and we lose ice, ice mass by it flowing across the grounding line, and then eventually it will calve off and, and go out to the ocean and melt. We can also have um, ablation where we have melt. It just melts at the surface and flows off, or it sublimates <coughs> away. And when you see, and you can Google iceberg calving, you'll see these catastrophic events of the ice flowing and big icebergs um, breaking up, rolling over, they're very dramatic. That is not what I study, that's much more exciting. I study snow accumulation, it's quite boring. So I study the input term. So snow falls, it accumulates on the surface, and it gradually flows out and has these catastrophic calving events. If we want to understand mass balance, we need to understand how much goes out and how much comes in. So the snow accumulation. And I'll uh, talk with you about the snow accumulation. We do three types, kind of, of research. We do satellite-based research, airborne research, and ground-based research. And what I'm showing here on the right-hand side, in red, is one season worth of data. If you were using a satellite, if you were using airborne research, and if you were using ground-based research. And the ground-based research, you'll see a little triangle right here. It's very small. And Satellites are very expensive. Airborne research, not, not as much, and, and ground-based is, is, is quite cheap. Um, but you get what you pay for. If we want to monitor what's going on with the entire ice sheet, we really need to be working at the satellite level. And we only go down to the airborne or ground-based research if there's something that we really want to figure out, some process that we need to understand more about because ideally we always want to be monitoring the entire ice sheet. Well, accumulation, it turns out, I spent a lot of time trying to um, get accumulation from satellites, and satellites don't do a great job at it. So I had put in um, one of my first, so, so, so we, we can't operate really at this satellite level. Um, to determine accumulation, how it's changing year to year accumulation. And it's very important to understand how accumulation is changing because precipitation increases <coughs> as temperatures warm.
So if you think about big thunderstorms that come through, they're warm storms and they'll drop a lot of precipitation. We know the climate's warming, and for quite a while, the climate models have predicted, what I'm showing here in blue, is a 10 to 20% increase in precipitation. And the models predicted over the next century we'll have a 10 to 20% increase in precipitation in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. And we've been having a lot of melt and losing a lot of mass through ice motion speed up of the ice sheets. So it would be really good if we were adding mass to offset some of the mass that were lost through accumulation. And what you'll see is it says the precipitation increase may result in an increased storage of ice in Antarctica to partially offset other contributions of sea level rise. However, an increase in precipitation has not been observed <coughs> to date. Um, this was in 2007. It still hasn't been increased, so spoiler alert, we still have not seen this increase in accumulation, but we really are looking for it. So here's how, how do we measure accumulation on the ice sheets. Again, it snows every year on the ice sheets, it's cold, it's cold, so it builds up. And you build up a stratigraphy of, of ice layers. Each layer is one year. It compresses under its own weight, so the layers will get denser as you go down, and it goes all the way down to the bottom of the ice sheet, um, about 10,000 feet. So if we want to go and measure accumulation on the ground, we can do it in a couple ways. So one of my first tasks when I came to NASA, one of my first proposals and research projects that I went out, is we didn't know what was going on with accumulation in West Antarctica. So we said, we'll go out with the best tool that we had at the time. Okay, this is 2010, so this is just four years ago. And this is kind of important. We went out with snowmobiles and a radar mounted on a sled, and we were going to take ice cores and use the radar across space to determine accumulation. Here's the team to get to Antarctica. Uh, we take a C-130, it lands out in the middle of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, we got out, it left us there. There's a, a camp there where they were drilling a very deep ice core. We had our snowmobiles and all of our gear, and we set out to drill ice cores. So an ice core at one location will tell us what the accumulation rate is. We're drilling through those layers that I just showed you. So the drill goes down into the ice sheet. We pick up the core. You'll see the core hanging in the core barrel here. You detach the core barrel. This is an ice core processing station. This is all done in the field. It's relatively cold out. It's probably about the temperature it is today. <laughs> the core comes out. And um, we package it up and send it back to the lab for further analysis. So again, I'll just kind of show you here, we're drilling down. This is going to tell us how much snow fell at this one location. The measurements that we take in the field is we measure the length of the core. We'll run an electrical conductivity that tells us about the uh, acids in the core, the different compositions of, of the water. And then we put it into an ice core tube and into this box to ship back. Something very important. We always need to know where the, um, where the ice core is, how they go in order. So how can we tell where the top of the ice core is? Does anyone see it in the picture? The arrow. The arrow. The arrow will always point to the top. This is the most important thing when you're drilling an ice core. You make sure that we always process it one way, the arrow will go to the top. So go back to the lab. Um, the, the ice cores all get flown back. Um, these ice cores were processed at uh, Brigham Young University, um, and we process them. Um, they look at the different snow. It looks at an isotopic ratio of, ox of, of oxygen. And when you have warmer temperatures, you have um, heavier isotopes, and when you have colder temperatures, you have lighter isotopes. So it shows us this isotopic difference, winter, summer, winter, summer and we can date the core going back. 
This is looking down into the ice sheet, down the borehole. You're looking back in time here. And I should mention that this traverse that we did, uh, the first year we did 350 kilometers, the second year we did 650 kilometers, and we were just studying satellite era accumulation. Satellite era isn't very long, uh, 30 to 40 years, so our ice cores were not very long. They were about um, 20 meters long. Now ice cores, again, they only tell us what the, the accumulation was at one point. And if we're going to compare that to satellites that measure over large space, it's very difficult to take one point measurement and <coughs> extrapolate that over space. So we use these very high frequency near surface uh, radars. These are in the 2 to 8 gigahertz range and the 10 to 12 gigahertz range. Here's a transmit, so you're going to transmit an um, uh, electromagnetic wave. It'll come down, it'll penetrate into the snow, it'll bounce back to the receive horns. So here we have what's called the snow radar and the KU band radar. Um, these radars are developed by the University of Kansas Center for Remote Sensing of Ice Sheets. You have an operator that sits here and makes sure the um, radar is running. GPS to tell us where we are, and this is actually me driving the snowmobile. I'm going to show you this, this um, animation is made for Ice Bridge, but look at the gray line. So the green line is a, is a altimeter, so that's like what I said, it bounces right off the surface of the ice sheet. The gray line is a near surface radar, it's going to image, give you a 3D image of the top surface of the ice sheet. And the black line is what we call depth sounding radars, they go all the way to the base of the ice sheet. So, Having all three of these instruments in tandem gives us a 3D view of the ice sheet. Again, when we were doing this on the ground, I just had that gray line radar imaging approximately the top 20 meters. Here's what the data looks like. We're going to zoom in here to West Antarctica. This is the actual data that we gathered. And let me see. So this animation was not working great. So let me just escape out of here. And uh, I'm going to run this animation so you can see the data. And what you're going to see in the radar data is a lot of lines. And those lines are that stratigraphy of built up year after year of accumulation. And when we're at the waist divide side, they're very close together. It's a low accumulation region. As we traverse across the divide, again, these are um, radar echoes coming from below, the lines get farther apart. We're at the higher accumulation side of the divide, and you'll see the lines get closer together as you go back to the low accumulation side of the divide. The blue lines are where the ice cores are um, in our traverse route. Again, this was about 350 kilometers. You can see all these lines. It shows us exactly what the accumulation rate was as soon as we give that year a date. So we take this data. And here it is up close. You can count this back just like tree rings. Here's the surface of the ice sheet here at zero. We're looking down into the ice sheet. This is 2010, um, 2009, 8, 2005. It was a low accumulation here. You can see it's quite close. We know all of this because we have ice cores at one end and at the other end. We follow a line across. And now we have accumulation over a large region. And this type of accumulation is easier to compare with a satellite image than just accumulation in a single point in space. So as we were doing this traverse, um, and the outcome of this traverse, actually, I'll tell you, is that when we looked at all the course together, we saw a decreasing trend in accumulation from 1970 to 2010. And it was actually uh, slightly negative and statistically significant. So, we were scratching our heads, well, what's, what's going on? Because we're supposed to be seeing this increase, and like I said, we're still looking for this increase in accumulation because this temperatures over this region have warmed, but we're still not seeing that increase in accumulation, which we want to see to help offset some of the mass loss that's occurring. Um, and again, we still haven't seen it. At the same time, and I that we were doing that traverse, Operation Ice Bridge started. And 
Before that traverse, we had never taken these near-surface radars and done long uh, traverses for accumulation. When Operation Ice Bridge started, again, to continue that altimetry measurement started by ISAT, we loaded the plane up with all of these radars. And here's the accumulation radar and the snow radar. So for the first time, we had these radar measurements, these 3D views of the ice sheets going into a major aircraft campaign. So I, I was a little, a little upset, actually. I just spent, I don't know, six weeks getting down to Antarctica and back, and 20 days out being very cold, driving a snowmobile around on the ice sheet. And in three years, this is the coverage that they were able to get with the radars. And it really made those snowmobile traverses um, obsolete in such a short period of time. And it took them uh, a few hours to fly over the over 1,000 kilometers uh, that we had gathered. But we could then see the ground-based radar and the airborne-based radar. And we could see that they were the same and that there was really no reason to to continue to gather that airborne data. And now what we can do is when we fly the, that same radar over uh, Greenland, we can start to map the accumulation. And previous to this, it's very difficult to map accumulation on the ice sheets. Here, every major airport can tell us how much snow fell. Um, but there are no major airports in the middle of the ice sheet, so we have very few actual measurements of accumulation. We have a few ice cores, but now we're starting to get spatial pictures, and we had been modeling what accumulation looks like. And here on the right is a model of what accumulation looks like. We're using the same color scale, and you can see that, that the models are actually doing quite a good job. And so having this new airborne data is giving us more confidence in the models of accumulation. And we will always you know, need to be modeling accumulation over the region with the models. Uh, the measurements help validate that. As IceBridge was flying these missions, um, here in southeast Greenland, some, some uh, at this time, uh, a, another group of scientists was looking at accumulation in southeast Greenland. So accumulation in southeast Greenland has the highest accumulation in all of Greenland. You can see it here in blue. And if we do not know accumulation correctly in southeast Greenland, it's such a large signal that it could swamp the entire accumulation in the other larger part of Greenland. So we need to get accumulation right in this region. But because the accumulation is so high, it means it's snowing all the time. It's not a pleasant place to work. The wind blows very hard harshly. They have not been able to keep a weather station there because it will just blow off the ice sheet or fall over or be buried in snow. It's a difficult region to get to logistically, but we knew we needed to get accumulation right there and we needed more ice cores. So um, some colleagues were doing a traverse and they were traversing just like we had done in Antarctica over into this region to drill some ice cores. And we were also looking at the radar data. And as they were doing that, again, I'm going to show you a lot of radar data. Here's our radar data with our nice stratigraphy going across. And what is this? This big line that's going up and down. Well, something that attenuates radar like that, um, or causes a big signal, would be something like water. Well, what would water be doing in this very cold part of the ice sheet? Well, sure enough, they started drilling into the ice sheet. They drilled down here at this site, and the drill, which should only drill in dry, cold snow, hit water layer. Came up dripping with water. They were very worried. The driller was like, you're going to ruin the drill and the electronics in the drill. OK, they moved a little farther. They drilled down, they hit water again. This is something that we did not expect to be in Greenland. Um, and, it, and it was a new discovery. And it was something that we probably should have thought was in Greenland because water features like this are not uncommon in mountain glaciers. But this region is so much colder, we didn't think it would persist as water. But it has such high accumulation, and that accumulation can insulate things. And this water 
was forming. We didn't really know anything about it. We knew where the surface was. We used the ice bridge data in the region, and these are all the black dots, to figure out where the water was. And a colleague, Rick Forrester, um, at University of Utah, presented this work at um, one of our scientific conferences, and some modelers came up to him. And these blue, uh, the color scale in the background, is a model, it's called the RACMO model. It's a, it's a, a model that can, can model how much snow falls over the ice sheets. And they said, our model keeps predicting water and we thought it was wrong. We thought the model was wrong. Can we compare where our model saw the water to where the radar saw, saw water? And you can see that they were almost exactly lined up. Well, we knew we needed to understand more about this water that was being stored in the Greenland ice sheet. We called it the Fern Aquifer. It's good to know where it is, um, but radar will just penetrate to the top of the water. We don't know how deep it is. So we could see the spatial extent, but we knew no idea about how much water was in the aquifer. So we went back with a different drill, and our goals were to drill through the aquifer to investigate what the fern looked like. And I'm sorry, I've been using fern. Fern is year old snow. Um, so snow on its first birthday turns to fern. Um, and we use that term in the, uh, for ice sheet science because the snow stays around longer. And we wanted to look at you know, what the structure of, of, of the snow or fern looked like, estimate the water volume, and figure out what the temperatures were, because the temperatures would be much warmer than we would have expected. We would have expected them to be about negative 25 degrees in this region at depth. Um, and they were obviously close to zero if water was there. So we deployed thermistor arrays. We were able to drill through. We used a mechanical drill in the top surface and a thermoelectric drill, shown here, where this annulus is heated and it goes down into the, fur, or the ice once we got to the water layer. You can see there's water dripping out here. We collected some to take back for samples. In the fern or the snow above where the aquifer was, you see where the light's coming through here and it's white? These are all just like where rivers of water was percolating down. We call it piping. And so this, had, this fern structure here was very well developed so that water could melt at the surface and then percolate down quite quickly where it was insulated from the cold atmosphere. And think of this like a snow cone or a slushy. We would pull out the ice cores and you see all this water, this is water cooling here. If you take the ice core, you could slosh it back and forth and watch the water go back and forth. Just like in the 80s, they had these oil and water um, toys you could tilt back and forth. And we're at, you know, it's like negative 20 C where we're standing here at the surface. So it's very, very cold. Um, and this water <coughs> persisted through the winter, we knew that. So we started to drill through it. When we drilled through it, we drilled through 24 <coughs> meters of ice with water in it. Um, and we took the temperatures of not only the ice cores that came out, but we left a temperature string in for a year. Um, when we get to 12 meters down in the ice sheet, that's like four stories down into the ice sheet, it was zero degrees. Um, and it's remained at zero degrees all year round. Why does that matter? Warm ice flows faster than cold ice. We had been predicting this ice to be very cold, and it's actually quite warm. So, this is a great tool. This is, this is what they, uh, if, if you have a plumbing problem and they send a video camera down your, your pipes, <laughs> this is the video camera that they send. We took one of these just to, to send it down the borehole and to look at, at what the water looked like. And, and here's what we saw. We're at, we're at uh, about 12 meters down. You see waters here, air bubbling through it. As soon as we went through this area, you see water with all the bubbles coming up. And that bubbles, those bubbles are caused by the air that's still within the fern. So we're looking at uh, an area of snow with water in it and also still some air bubbles. 
So with this <coughs> measurement and the spatial extent, uh, we were able to, to make a to make estimate. This paper is actually coming out. This is kind of hot off the press of science. It's, it's coming out on Sunday in the paper. Um, and we could see that there were 140 gigatons of water. Well, that's about 0.4 millimeters of sea level rise. So this is water that would have melted at the surface of the ice sheet and it's stored. Instead of reaching the ocean, it was stored. But we don't know how long it's stored for or how long it's been stored. Um, we're going back in April to take some of those measurements to see if the water's flowing. And to give you a sense of scale, this 0.4 millimeters of sea level rise, that is about a year of melt, or half of, sorry, half of a total year of melt over the Greenland ice sheet. So in one year, that would be storing about half of uh, Greenland's total contribution to sea level rise. This is a pretty large storage of water, especially if it's a relatively new feature that's, that's building up. But we don't know what's, what's really happening, if it's building up and releasing catastrophically, or if the amount that comes in and the amount that goes out is the same every year. And again, we'll be studying that, so there'll be a lot more to come on this, what it means. <clears throat> so I spent a lot of time on the ice sheets, and you know, a lot of times the weather's like this. And it's not super fun. Uh, it's, it's cold, the wind blows, uh, you get all iced up in your face masks, and especially when we were doing the traverses, we said, there has to be a better way to do this. Someone came into my office one day and said, we have a bunch of summer interns here. And the summer interns are here to build robots. Do you have any science that a robot could do? I said, yes. Can you build a robot that looks like a snowmobile and that could carry one of our radars that measures accumulation? Can you make it fully autonomous and solar powered so we could run it all season? And they're very cheap compared to our aircraft flights. Uh, we won't have aircraft flights forever uh, once ISAT 2 is launched. So let's see if we could build a robot. And lo and behold, over two summers, a bunch of summer engineering, summer interns at Goddard built me the Grover robot. And last summer, we took it to Summit Greenland, right in the center of Greenland. And little Grover uh, went over 30 kilometers, 20 miles, um, and, and gathered, gathered radar data. Here's Grover at Summit. He moves pretty slow. You see his tracks, our two snowmobile tracks. This is the radar sitting right here, taking the measurements. And um, off Grover goes. He had a few, few small problems. He, uh, he didn't have a lot of redundancy built into him. So if something broke, they had to go out, take their gloves off, fix him. Um, so he's, he's getting some redundancy built into him. Well, Grover had a, had a pretty specific science mission to do this summer. Um, we look at the normal accumulation uh, rates, like I've been talking about, but also in 2010, in 2012, there was an extreme melt event over Greenland. What I'm showing here on July 8th, in red, this is the areas where there was surface melt on Greenland, where the temperature was about zero degrees what was above zero degrees C. And we know this, the dark red is where two or more satellites said there was melt, and the pink areas are where just one satellite. So we're using different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, and some go through clouds and some don't. So the near IR didn't go through clouds, and so it might not have registered um, a melt signal when some of our passive microwave or active microwave instruments did register melt. On July 12th, nearly the entire surface of the Greenland ice sheet, 97% experienced surface melt. This is not unheard of at Summit. Some of the ice cores do have ice layers, um, but it has only happened once since the last medieval warming period. So this is un relatively unprecedented. And Grover went to not only measure accumulation, but to take the first measurements of how thick this ice layer was. And he was able to accomplish that, um, our science goal. And, and again, this was a student project. The student here, um, Mark Robinson, is showing this is the surface of the ice sheet 
in blue here was um, the radar showing that melt layer. And it was an average of 2.36 centimeters. So we were able to really measure um, that melt layer thickness. And so this is pretty new and exciting science. So I actually wanted to reflect a little bit on the past. Um, this is the Scott expedition going towards the South Pole 150 years ago. And you see that they're using ponies. They have a little science uh, distance measurer here. And it doesn't look all that different than our Traverse did in 2010. We have a science, you know, we're using snowmobiles instead of ponies. Um, but it doesn't look that different. But our future monitoring, I think, will look quite different. Our future monitoring of the ice sheets, it'll still have satellites. But we're going to use a lot of aircraft. We'll have uh, robots that are able to, to monitor ice sheets. And in the Cassie mission, it was the first time they used one of these uh, UASs, so uh, an unmanned aerial system, or a drone, if you will, um, that's been able to go out and monitor sea ice. And soon those will be used to monitor the ice sheets. So future monitoring will look quite different. Well, so what's going on with the ice sheets? Well, they're still losing mass in the accumulation. It can't keep up. Uh, the melt is, is too much in Greenland for the accumulation to keep up with and the same with Greenland. These are some of the latest charts from the recent um, international panel on climate change, IPCC reports. And what you see, this is from 1992 to 2012, and you'll see an increase in sea level rise coming from Greenland, an increase in Antarctica, though not as much. And what's kind of interesting about this um, is that in the last, since 1992 to the period of, from 1992 to 1996, compared to the period from 2007 to 2011, Greenland has more than quadrupled its input into sea level rise. And if you look at this red line, if you connect these red dots, these are from Antarctica, it's relatively stable. If you look at Greenland, and if you look here, you see that Greenland is accelerating in the past decade. Um, so the melt over Greenland, mainly from surface warming, has increased substantially. So what should we expect in the future? I think there's going to be large increases in Greenland's contribution to sea level rise in the next decade. There will still be increases from Antarctic's contribution. I think Greenland is, is going to uh, continue this accelerating trend. It's warming there. Um, and, and the Arctic amplification increased warming um, will significantly hurt Greenland. There will be increased warming at the poles. Um, and the temperature increases are due to the CO2 in the atmosphere. There's going to be scientific debate in the next few years over what this stored water in the Greenland ice sheet is doing for both ice flow and for modeling it for future sea level rise predictions. If you want more information or any of the animations and things that I showed, uh, you can Google NASA Ice Bridge, NASA Ice Set 2, Greenland Aquifer, and go to the NASA SVS website. That's the NASA Scientific Visualization Studios. It's where a lot they make a lot of these um, animations so you can use in your class. With that I'll ask for any questions. Any chance that Greenland is behaving differently? I guess decreased albedo because of pollution from North America, landing on the ice and getting dirty. So Yes, that could happen. They have been taking measurements, and they took measurements, uh, Steve Warren took some measurements in the, I want to say 80s, early 80s. And I actually took some measurements for him in 2008. They were cleaner. So because of the soot levels are getting cleaner, but the melt does the same thing that soot does. When you melt a surface, it'll get darker. And the increased melt over Greenland is decreasing the albedo. And that's what um, we believe most of the decrease in albedo over the Greenland ice sheet is due to the melt, not the pollutants. So I'm curious about this Greenland aquifer, the fern aquifer. So the water goes down, but it's not very deep. 
And, and there it just seems to sit. Is there any, any indication that that water ends up going down to the base of the entire glacier, or does it seem to sit on, on top of the actual glacier? Yes. In which case it wouldn't affect the flow. So right now, eventually, we would think it would make its way. We had some of the first evidence in one flight line of the aquifer flowing into a crevasse and dropping down to the base. We do think that eventually it'll get to the base. Our question is, is how quickly and how steadily? The, we, do, we do know that some of the glaciers in southeast Greenland have relatively rapid speed ups and slowdowns, and that might be a connection with the aquifer. Again, that's all speculation at this point, um, and we're going to continue to get the measurements and understanding how quickly the water is flowing within that space. Is the aquifer basically a bunch of slush? Yes, yeah, so it is more towards the top. So it, at the top, um, it, it still holds together in a core when it comes out. Uh, so it's just like snow with water in it. And then as you get deeper, the snow is compacting and it's compacting at a much faster rate because the extra weight of the water is there. And then we call this a, a if we didn't have water in the ice, we call it poor close-off depth. So that's when the ice compacts down and you have a bubble of air stuck in the ice. Well, here, you actually get a water pocket stuck in the ice. Um, and we're calling it the poor refreeze depth. So the ice actually will densify enough that it's isolated this water. And at that point, it has to start to refreeze because of the thermodynamic setting. So is it salt or, or fresh water? This is fresh water. It is fresh water. It's fresh water that has come from the surface of the ice sheet and just percolated down. And then and then it percolates down far enough and it has high enough accumulation that that accumulation insulates it from the cold atmosphere. How, how thick is the water? Um, it different, it's about three, it, at the center, it's about um, three kilometers. Mm -hmm. And in the area where the aquifer is, it's about uh, 800 meters. Now the funny thing is, is that we use those depth sounding radars. If you remember the animation of the plane flying and there was a black line that would go all the way down to the base. Well, we've been trying to figure out what the bed of the Greenland ice sheets look like since 1992, and they've flown over this region with those depth sounding radars, and we always said, hmm, something's wrong, we can't get a bed return. And that not getting a bed return is probably because this water has been there for some time. Is it, is it scattered, the, uh, the radar? It, yeah, it, it absorbs radar and attenuates, oh. attenuates it, the water does, yeah. It, 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 almost all frequencies. There's a few frequencies uh, that will actually take back a radar that's uh, supposed to, they've, they've, they've had to go through some water because it's at the right frequency and power. Um, but we're, we also will try, if we can't go back, seismics or, or other different methods to constrain the volume. Wait, is there a question up here? Um, yeah, so Um, with this, we've, we've only, we, we haven't, so, so that will go back actually in April. In April, we're going to take a, a different radar system. And is this being used for uh, trying to figure out how they're going to have future probes for uh, like Europa? <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, the, some of the size, the size, the, the person who's working on the size the seismicity, we put seismometers here, um, comes out of thinking about putting seismometers on Europa. And the radars that we were looking at here in Earth Base, just like with Operation Ice Ridge, where we can have those radars, these radars uh, have they need too much power really to ever send to space. So they'll always be in an airborne platform or a, a ground-based platform until there's significant technology. Power that they need. 
Is there any evidence that these increased uh, ice flows yet are showing any measurable changes in that water flow diagram you showed at the beginning? in the water flow that I want to The thermal, oh, um, no. <laughs> no, but if you were to put, if this aquifer was large enough, and we think about it, like we had, we had this thing called meltwater pulse 1A where a big pulse of water came in. Um, this isn't large enough for that, but if it were to grow over time and space, you could theoretically think that 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 is not an area where you would want to be supplying a large amount of cool, fresh water um, for, the, for the global circulation. But we need a lot more water to be stored. Have you been able to determine the age of the stored water? No, we are taking uh, those measurements in April. And that will tell us a lot about how, how long it's been there. Can I one more question? To, oh, we have not done we have not done di di tracing with this. Um, and actually, even when you look through the core, we can see so many types and structures of the, that's where the dye would go through. Um, but again, we, we were doing this uh, before in April before and, um, it, when it's all frozen, all those types are more frozen. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and if you would uh, join me in thanking Mr. Conan for speaking tonight.